afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, an exciting time for services in, uh, in Asia. Uh, Asia is the fastest growing region in the world. Uh, and while, on, on the one hand, but on the other hand, while manufacturing is strong, actually services sector is actually quite weak and unproductive in Asia, which means that there's actually uh, increasing uh, potential for, for um, on the upside for more growth if uh, Asia can, uh, can increase its productivity in the services sector. So in both ways, in terms of fast growth and the fact that there's weak service uh, productivity, those are opportunities for American companies uh, who supply services. Also, Asian countries are hitting the, the limits of growth, and, uh, and part of the problem they have is, is, the, uh, is the need to have more uh, service uh, productivity to employ their people, to have more uh, equality in their economies, uh, to sustain growth over a long period of time. So again, a good time for opportunities in, uh, in Asia. Uh, we all kind of know and they know what the, uh, what, the, what the requirement is for the services industry. It needs to be deregulated, it needs to be liberalized. Um, but of course, that's a, that's, a, that's a challenging policy in, in any country. Uh, and this is why we're here this afternoon to talk about that agenda. What, is, what are the opportunities for service, uh, uh, services trade in, in Asia? What, how does services, how does services development contribute to age growth, uh, and how can American companies benefit from that, uh, from that process? Today we have a, a panel of uh, experts, as you see. It's a, it's a, it's a very strong uh, and high caliber uh, panel, with the exception of the moderator. And, the, uh, and without further ado, let's let's, uh, let's talk about the uh, the issues. The first uh, panelist is Ambassador Demetrius Marantis. Um, Demetrius is, as you all know, that we uh, USDR works on uh, Asia and African uh, trade organization and trade enforcement, also in charge of trade uh, and development and labor and environment. Um, his background, he's worked on the Hill. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with him uh, when he was in USTR in the Office of General Counsel. Uh, and uh, and uh, he also has worked in Asia, and I realize this in the end of the month. So uh, without further ado, let's start with uh, kind of an overview of the region, particularly from the trade union team. Uh, that's what it is. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I don't know if my, my mic is on. Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank CSI for putting this together again. And I know today's probably been David's mom has an email that was used by Daniel Moss here, but thanks, Mom, for all of the you know, amazing work you've done over the years in terms of promoting service sector liberalization here in Washington and, and being so instrumental um, at convening this, this summit um, for the past few years. You've all heard already from Ambassador Kerr, from Ambassador Tom, um, from Mike Perlman. I'm not sure really what I have to add to the picture in there, but um, what I thought I would do is try to give a little bit more of a sense of some of the specific initiatives we have underway in, in the Asian Pacific region that affect services. Um, I would sort of categorize the parts that the services initiatives that we're pursuing in, the, in you know, generally globally, but specifically in Asia Pacific. First, we're working on things like TPP, where we're really trying to push the envelope um, in service sector liberalization and are reaching um, very broadly in terms of you know, setting the highest standard template that we can for service sector liberalization. Um, you know, second, and you heard a lot of this from, from Mike today, we are you know, working in the WTO on collaboratively uh, uh, on the international service agreement to really create a good template. Um, for services sector liberalization uh, amongst you know, like-minded countries. And third, and I think this is something that's often time in the world, there's a lot of bilateral work that we're doing in the services area, whether it's in the context of bilateral investment treaties or dialogues that we have with uh, particular countries in the region. So let me talk just a bit about each one of those three. The first is TCP, you know, which you hear about a lot. Um, the services sector, the it is, is again, it's an area where we really want to push the envelope and, and create the highest standard trade agreement that, that we are negotiating in the area of services sector as we're doing in, in other areas of the TPP. We're doing a ton of interesting things in services in TPP, but let me point to, I think, one which is um, you know, extremely relevant and extremely, you know, quote unquote, 21st century, and that's what we're doing in the area of, of, of data and how to um, you know, we have heard from, from, from you all, from exporters and from companies in the region, 
that we really can offer your services uh, in a market that you're not able to supply the data that's associated with those services. And that's why we think we can really, for the first time ever, we're trying to um, really create a free flow of data um, so that when you're offering your services, you're not you're not blocked by arbitrary restrictions that block websites or, or in some way restrict your ability to offer um, your service on a cross border basis. I think that's one of the very exciting things we're working on in services and TPP. Second, and similarly, in order to promote um, you know, cloud-based one of the key restrictions that we've seen pop up in markets is uh, a requirement to locate your data center in a particular jurisdiction in order to supply um, data or supply services in, in that, that sector. And that really does inhibit the growth of cloud services. And when you think about it, I mean, it's interesting, you think about cloud based services, what are they? And, and, and um, you know, not anybody even having the um, vision of what a cloud based service was, you know, even five years ago. It's, it's something that is not just so important from, uh, you know, the large companies or small and medium sized companies to be able to store and locate their data in the cloud. But think about it from a developmental perspective. Think about, and this example keeps coming back to me, which I find so interesting in terms of the identity of Vietnam, but um, you know, there is a great story of, of you know, a Indian rice farmer who is relying on a chip that's located in his tractor as he's plowing his rice field uh, in order to be able to assess the soil quality. Um, you know, something like that is un was unimaginable. Four years ago, but because of the opportunities that exist in the cloud, you know, we're able to, or or, or um, Vietnamese rice farmers are able to access information that they never before had at their fingertips, and that's why we're really trying to push the CPP um, obligation that would really enable these type of services to flourish. Um, second, on the international services agreement, I mean, you've heard a ton about that already. I'm not going to spend any time on it, other than. You know, we are working with some of our like-minded Asian Pacific partners, um, Australia, New Zealand, and, and us to, to really push that. Um, the third area that I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on is, is what are we doing bilaterally to further service sector localization? And, you know, we, we have spent a lot of time and actually gotten, you know, some criticism on how long it took us to release our new model bilateral investment treaty, which we released in, in, in April after a very thorough review. And on this basis, you know, we're working with our partners in the region, um, including India and China, in the effort to conclude a bilateral investment treaty with them. Why is that important? FITs, as you know, really do um, provide for important obligations that help to ensure transparency, fairness, investor protections, and provide a level playing field in terms of, of dispute settlement. And now that we have released our, our revised model, it really does give us an opportunity you know, with, with economies like China and India um, to make progress on, on the, you know, investment element of, of services. There's also um, bilateral dialogues that we have with a variety of other countries in the region where we promote service sector liberalization. Um, you know, we do have done a lot of work with India on services. Um, I know Nelson's going to talk more about India, so I'm not going to spend very much time, but what's very interesting on the Indian side is, you know, we all know India as a big services powerhouse exporter, um, but it's becoming more and more clear, I think, the importance of services imports into India's economy as a way of ensuring the competitiveness of Indian industry going forward. And recent developments with respect to um, liberalization in the, in the retail sector, for example, um, it, it, it is an example of, of this, and, I, and, and Nelson will talk more about that. China, I will conclude on, um, you know, we have made a lot of progress over the years in promoting service sector liberalization in China. Uh, you know, most recently at the SNED, where, um, you know, China provided um, assurances that it would allow our companies to provide mandatory third-party liability insurance, but as you all know, and as you all tell us, the investment services sector in China does remain um, you know, full of uh, restrictions. And whether it's looking at the revised foreign investment catalog, that did not go nearly as far as I think many of us had hoped in terms of opening new sectors to investment in China. 
to restrictions that China places on the cross-border supply of services, whether it's in the financial services sector, the telecommunications sector, the express delivery sector. Um, you know, there are many challenges that we continue to face in China's market and until um, China, I think, really realizes the importance of, of um, encouraging investment and liberalization in services. It, it, it is going to, I think, retard China's ability to accomplish its you know, very real goal of becoming an innovative economy. Um, there's a lot more that, that I can say, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so let me stop there. And, sorry, Great. Thanks, Amitis. Um, Amitis mentioned uh, India and China as, uh, say, two major important uh, countries in the region for us. And, uh, that's, uh, Next two speakers will address those. Let's start with India. Um, Nelson Cunningham is the managing partner and co-founder of McLarty Associates. Uh, he has a, a background uh, that's uh, in your in your folder, so we'll go over it all. But he was uh, he was uh, he worked in the, in the White House uh, during the Clinton administration as special advisor in the Western Hemisphere, um, and in a number of other positions, important positions. Um, he has spent the last uh, six years building the Indian practice of McLarty. He's been, spent a lot of time in India during that time. Uh, so, uh, look forward to uh, Nelson's comments on the Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Larry, and thanks, Demetrius, for, for that broad, uh, broad introduction. Uh, I'll join the Bob Bastien fan club here uh, as well, uh, as well as the Your Allgaier fan club. That's really a terrific turn for the organization. You know, a lot of us, uh, while sorry to say goodbye to Bob, are just delighted to see the organization bring on somebody as strong as um, here to talk about India, if I had been here sitting in front of you two weeks ago, uh, I would have been frankly a little haggard looking, uh, a little despondent. Uh, you would have seen some, some wear on my suit and, uh, and on the soles of my shoes from walking the pavements in Delhi. Today, because of the dramatic announcements made last Friday, I've got a new spring in my step. Uh, the same government which had, which had blocked and held up had been considering a variety of key pro-business reforms abruptly announced them last Thursday and Friday. Uh, after long pushing by uh, U.S. interests, including Walmart and others, and other international interests, they opened up the retail sector uh, to foreign direct investment. Uh, they opened up the civil aviation sector to permit foreign aviation companies to now take stakes in Indian aviation companies. They opened up a, a big swath of the telecom sector, uh, the cable television sector in particular, to foreign investment. They didn't do everything. I see some people out here in the insurance sector, including Larry Greenwood, who are gnashing their teeth, that insurance, insurance FBI didn't quite make it over the top. But make no mistake about it, that set of reforms, and there, and there were others that I won't go into, uh, price caps on, on subsidies for fuel and others, that set of reforms last week, it's the most dramatic set of reforms uh, we've seen in the last two decades in India, really since the great opening started in 1991, under Manmohan Singh's first incarnation as finance minister. So I walk into this session with just a great deal of excitement about the opportunities uh, now for the American investment community and American companies in India. Uh, let's talk about services uh, let's talk about the role of services in, historically in India. Let's talk about the role of services today in, in India's current slowdown. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about uh, the opportunities for a bilateral investment treaty to, uh, to drive forward growth in services and investment in services by U.S. companies. First of all, uh, the role of services in the Indian economy uh, has been dramatic. 60%, 60% of the Indian economy uh, is in services. And it employs 34% of labor base. Uh, compare this to agriculture, which is only 14% of the economy, yet employs over half of the labor force. Industry is only 27% of economic output and has 14%. So when you look at services, already 60%, already uh, employing 34% of the labor force, you see what a dramatic impact growth in services in India has had on their current economic state and what it could do for them going forward. Uh, 
and it's been growing fast. It's been growing at a rate of 10% a year, as opposed to 8% for industry, 4% for agriculture. I mean, the trend is clear. Net-net, services are the largest share of the Indian economy, and they're the fastest growing piece of the Indian economy. Uh, since the slowdown in 2008, services have continued to help buoy India's economy in the face of a global slowdown. Again, we've seen growth rates in services continue at 10%, which was at their, their pre-financial crisis levels. They've continued that here in the post-financial crisis area. While industry has been cut in half from 10% a year down to 5% a year, agriculture has gone from 4% to almost zero growth. So services has done its part in keeping the Indian economy going since the financial crisis. And it continues to, to overperform when it comes to growth. But there are limits to what the services economy alone can do to drive India forward. Part of it is because uh, you know, the service industry so far has been in the high value added areas. Think of computer engineers, think of research scientists, uh, think of the uh, think of the outsourcing uh, centers in, in Gurgaon, outside of, outside of Delhi. High paying jobs, high value added, truly participating in a global economy and so able to reap the higher wages of that global economy. But there are certain problems with that going forward, certain limitations going forward. The first is uh, they're dependent on the US and on Europe. Unless we continue growing, they can't. Second, we're already employing a large number of, of Indians who have the high advanced degrees, and there are only so many of them that you can bring into the sector. So what is left in the services sector? It's the middle skill areas, such as retail uh, and insurance, areas where people with lower levels of education uh, can get good paying jobs that can drive their families forward and add substantially to the Indian economy. These are the areas where India needs to focus. Lastly, let me turn to where a bit uh, might help drive the services sector and might help advance matters. Can it do so? I think the answer is clearly yes, but only if we on the US side are willing to insist on high standards for a bit. There'll be those who'll be looking to race toward a bit to get it done to show forward progress and momentum in the relationship. Uh, I'm one of those who would argue that we ought to, we ought to look for a near-term and medium-term set of goals. But let's, let's be ambitious in what we're looking for from a bit. Uh, let's look for it to deal with the key sectors that we care about, including the services sectors, uh, which really could drive, uh, drive that services sector forward. Now, how are we going to do on these bid talks? They've been going for a long time. They started in the Bush administration. They've been continuing now. Uh, Demetrius and his staff have been deeply involved in this, and I, I won't go into it any further than to say, you know, the Indians start in a very different place than we do, but there are signs that they're warming to uh, what we have put on the table. Uh, it, would be, it would be a really signal accomplishment in the U.S.-India relationship to be able to set a bit as a near-term as a near-term goal, and if we can be ambitious included their performance requirements, market access, transparency on regulation setting, and the others, we can find, we can craft something meaningful that will drive the services sector forward. Let me just, let me just end on this. Uh, I hope that it is not the last thing that we think about doing with the Indians. Uh, I moderated a panel just yesterday with the spokesman, with the key spokesman of the Congress party, the ruling Congress party, and of the opposition BJP party and one of our audience members said, what is the next big idea in U.S.-India relations? And they both said an FTA. If you had said that two years ago, I would have dropped it before. But where you got the two chief spokesmen for the two leading parties in India, each saying an FTA is the next, idea, is the next big idea in U.S.-India relations. Uh, Demetrius, I think you'd like to work that out for you. Thank you very much,